And we're on, Susan Sunda. Thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So I um, found out about you. I, I know your son from uh, White Pine Wilderness Academy. And I saw a post of his on Facebook that was a video of your artwork. And I was uh, blown away by it. it it looked really awesome, so I knew that I wanted to have you on the show, so I'm glad it, I'm glad it worked out. So, um, can you, uh, like, how did you, let's, um, I guess let's just start with uh, how did you get into the artwork, and then we can get into everything that kind of branches off of that. I grew up. And I knew that I loved to draw. It was drawing, drawing, drawing all the time when I was a little girl. And when I was five years old, I said, I'm going to be an artist when I grow up, which was really a lifesaver because I went to school and I could not read. And this, they put me in the class over here of non-readers and I would just fail the third grade. And they didn't, ha they didn't call it dyslexic then, they just called it slow and other people called it stupid. But I knew I wasn't stupid. So I was like, ah! But in the fifth grade, my teacher, she was awesome. She said, oh, she saw me drawing all the time. And she said, okay, draw this giant big picture. We'll read this book, get through it, and draw the, and just draw a really big illustration and then just write about the bottom. And she was my lifesaver. That was Mrs. Faulkner. She just saved my life. And then I did not know I was dyslexic for a long time, but I just kept doing my art. And my dad didn't think I should go to college because I was just an artist. And I found a school in Cincinnati that was co-op. And so I went in graphic design and so I just was always an artist and then all through my life people were saying you got to get a job you got to get a job and you know, I have my kids and I'm going no this is my talent I can if I sell a really big piece of artwork once a month I'm happy so this is a went my own path I took the road less travel which was a challenge but it was also so fulfilling yeah, yeah it, it's pretty amazing I was just talking with someone um, I can't quite remember who it is. It'll pop up to me, but they're like saying, like, if, if you have your thing, just make it work. You'll make it work. So right. you don't have to have that other job, the normal job. And, you know, some people seem to be able to make that work and, and some people don't, but. And you don't have to live up to their values. You live up to your values. Not a competition. Yeah. yeah. I like that. The, like Bruce Lee said something like that. He's like, I'm not here to please you and you're not here to please me so <laughs> he was uh yeah he um that's a whole different thing but uh so why is, is all the artwork you do now is it native american or do you do other i do styles? animals also i love the animals and how they what they teach you and i so i have my animals that i Put and make with a lot of there's a lot of animal um, teaching in the native culture. They learn all kinds of things from the different animals, and so uh, I can show you one of my paintings that I kind of started. I had a I had a gallery up in Patoska, Michigan. They said, "Well, look at the get the directions," and I said, "What? What is that?" And so they said, "You just do some research and you find it." And then I did find it. I found the story. And it was Lakota Sioux. About to get the directions. And I'll show you this painting. And for those of you who are just listening, she's going to uh, tell the stories behind them. But the video will be on YouTube. It's the Fitness and Consciousness YouTube channel. And you can also find it on Patreon. And if for some reason you, you can't find it there, you can go to the Fitness and Consciousness uh, Facebook page and find it there. So it, it should be easy enough. So this is a paint. Uh, this is a painting of a girl, and it's um. All the aspects or all the different uh, qualities that the, uh, the Indian would like to have in their lives are given to them by women, and when you're born, you're given. It was a white-haired, the white-haired wolf woman. I don't know if I can get the wolf up there or not, can I get the wolf up there? Uh, the wolf? A little to the left. I'm oh, sorry, I'm dyslexic, so that's kind of hard. I can see the dragonfly, I can see the nose, eyes. Anyway, the, uh, the wolf is of uh, trust and innocence. 
And so you're born with trust and innocence, but you cannot go, I'm reading this in a book and it says you cannot go through life with just trust and innocence because people will take advantage of you and go, yo, yes, because hmm. that's what happens to artists sometimes. But you need to get the wisdom of the buffalo. So the black haired buffalo woman brings them the wisdom. Did, did I do the buffalo? Um, maybe scoot it back a little bit. Okay. A little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah, I can see. I, I can hear people and bring them um, judgment and wisdom. And the white hair buffalo, that's why it's so important in the culture, the Indian culture, the Native American culture, because that's spiritual wisdom. But we are here on earth and you're not any like anybody else. And so you want the, the introspection of the black bear. So it's a black haired bear woman. And before you go through this whole life, you want to get, you want the yellow haired elk woman who gives you love and illumination. And that's the gift of direction, the Lakota Sioux. And that's my illustration. So I yeah, love that. Amazing. One. This one here is Spirit Seeker. Spirit Perfect. Seeker. And this one here, I was just hiking with friends and we saw a really cool animal up the street, a guardian spirit, said, oh my gosh, look at that. And that was a bobcat. Wow. And that's Lucinda, and that's how I do my work. It's all like three dimensional. What was the story behind the spirit seeker, the one before that one? She has, she's holding her smudge pot, which is bringing spirits in. Mm. And the spirits are coming out of the, the smudge pot, and she has her feather. And also for um, clarity and cleansing. And I just, I just kind of went crazy with all the different, different kinds of spirits. There's Pachinas in there too. Is that Coca Pelli? Yeah. Uh huh. Let's remind me, I used to have a, a Coca Pelli, a, a little flute necklace thing with Coca Pelli on it. Oh, nice. So that's just that. And then this is um, one over here is um, Mother's Song. And I just read about the Lakota Sioux, where the babies are born, they take the umbilical cord and they put it into a little a beaded pouch and they put in there the, um, the, the, the umbilical cord, they hang it around the neck and that protects the baby for a year. And there's like little frogs, which is transformation. And um, turtles, which are protection, so it protects the baby. Which, wait, where's the camera? <laughs> I, I can, we can see it. Okay, it protects the baby, that's okay. And then this one here is one of my, really the biggest one here. And this is almost, it's going up and down. But he's a wisdom seeker and wisdom keeper. Wow. It's pretty big. Yeah. You can see from here. There. Can you get just a little bit closer to that one? Uh -huh. This one I had a rock. I usually use tools, and this one had a rock that was so cool because I could do my I could take my rock and I could hit my my um, leather on a rock with a rock, and so he's in a rock, but he's can you see the different all the different cool little textures? Yeah, wow, that was cool. So, and then my one of my favorite pictures here is called Kindred Spirits, and this was my. This is my dog that was part wolf. This is Cotty. So this is Cotty when she was younger. And she had a black stripe down her tail. And this is when she was older. Mm. And when you see pectoglyphs or pectographs that have polka dots, dots connecting, this is a spirit inside. Your, this is your spirit. And these are connecting. You're all you're connecting. So I was very much connected to my to my Cotty, my my partial wolf. What does Cotty mean? 
That was her name. Is, that was does it have a... Ivert Wolf. She was part of Latin Malamute. And I had to teach her that I was alpha because, you know, that's one thing that when there's a beta, is a omega, which is the lower, they want, they like to know where they are in the pack, then they're comfortable. Um, even with your dog, because you are a pack when you have a dog, that you want to be alpha, you don't want them to be the boss. And, and the beta is right beyond the, behind the alpha, and they're always trying to, is this the day I could be alpha? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, feed my dog. I had to, you know, put the dog, in, put the food in the dog food, in the, put the food in my hand and feed her. And so I just didn't put pour food down and I'd lay on top of her and make sure she didn't try to get out. I just kind of bite her neck sometime, which is kind of furry, but it was, it worked. So that was, so then I, I was in the, the inner city of Indianapolis and my little Honda hatchback and I could go visit my friends in the inner city and I could go to any neighborhood I wanted to and I felt safe. Mm. And my friends would say, Oh, don't forget to bring your dog. <laughs> so that was, that was really cool. That's a bad note. That's why I had her because I felt really safe in my house, in my 100-year-old house in, in, in the inner city of Indianapolis. So it, it was very cool. And I could go on hikes and stuff and not have any fear. That was nice. Yeah, we found out that when we talked the other day that you're talking about the house on uh, Washington Boulevard. Right, yeah. Yeah, we found out that we were pretty much neighbors at, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe some years apart, but <laughs> and then right next the door. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I had an Alaskan Malamute too, but <clears throat> I think he was the alpha. I'm I'm pretty sure I was the. I'm pretty sure he was the boss. He seemed yeah, to he do whatever he wanted to, and they like to be alpha. The his name was trying to be alpha. So yeah. Yeah, his name was Freedom Spirit, oh, and I so know. I. Uh, it's, it's like when I had him, I I kind of. I didn't want him to do a bunch of like tricks and stuff. I wanted him to just be a dog. Oh yeah. Like, I'm a human. He's a dog. He's not there to do tricks for me. Like lay down, roll over. And so I wanted <coughs> him to be kind of as wild as he could be. And, uh, but also, I mean, he was nice. Like he wouldn't really bite people or anything, but it was, uh, it was an interesting way of, raising a dog <laughs> well I, I do airbnb and someone brought a dog in to, to exchange a dog that was a labradoodle and they were sending it to people this young couple it people in um california and he sat outside in the summertime and he went through like 30 different commands and just then say good dog and just gave him little pieces of food little street things and i, I was like oh no this is their pet what are you doing? And so I said, let's go for a walk. And so I tried to get her to walk. She kept on stopping the dog and I was going, ah. And then I, I said, let's go, let's go faster forward. And I said, this is your dog. This is your family. Talk to your dog, please. And then she hugged me and said, thank you. Ah, mm. ah, <laughs> ah. Mm. Cause that was so sad that they were, she was just trying to go with what the, the trainer had just trained this dog to do all kinds of, things for her or you know it's kind of sad so i hope she learned something yeah yeah it's like a fine balance of figuring out like what the dog should be it has to be like somewhat controlled not, not 30 things yeah oh my goodness yeah oh i wanted to talk about the um because i'm a cub scout leader i love being a cub scout leader because i'm a cub scout leader of nine-year-olds and so they're not like kids anymore so much. And they're not like into that culture of teenager person yet. And I love to, um, we love, I love to make things with them and talk about, I like to talk about the Indians that lived up here because I live in the um, Ogden Valley, which is Snow Basin is my, let's see outside. I have a really awesome view. Let's see. Oh, wow. The view from my house. I walked into this house. It had one big window wall. And I came over and said, I love this house. And the realtor said, you haven't seen the house. And I said, I don't care. This is my organic garden. I have to wait for wintertime. Um, and I said, this, oh, this is the house. The house is, the house is 
this window. So mm. that was nice. So I, so I wanted to teach the, the, my Cub Scouts about the Indians that lived here and compare our way to their way. And I kind of went through a whole bunch of things that were how they lived in the world and how we live in the world. And their way is being one with nature. Our way is to rule over nature. Their way is to be stewards of the land and our, our way is to be owners, have ownership. When the settlers came over here, they put up fences and the, and the Lakota Sioux, the Indians did not have, they did not own land. It was very, they were very confused about that. Um, they also conserved re their resources. And we have a thing about consumption of resources. Um, they are wisdom seekers. We are information seekers. More information, more information. Look what I learned, look what I learned. Um, there's this cooperation, ours is competition. We learned that in school, competition. Um, and, and even in our sports, competition. Um, they're giving and sharing, and ours is saving and keeping. Mm. Uh, there's this respect for elders, and ours, us old people, we are, we are invisible, actually. They have a disregard for elders. Um, they had new, good nutrition, and they didn't have to read about it. They just, they found this, these awesome, raw, uh, wild foods, medicines, that we're now just discovering, or rediscovering. And ours is from going to any kind of store, which I don't go to, is poor nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, they have few diseases. We have many diseases, which we doctor, like with meds. If they had diseases, they're healing. It was a healing body, mind, and spirit. So I try to teach that. I, I, for a while there, it wasn't even in the scout book, but I just kind of added it because it was so important to the uh, young people to learn this. So there, isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, it, <clears throat> it's, it's amazing. And like, I think the kids are, they're ready for that stuff. They, I would think that they're like, most of them would be just receptive from it because just at, at working at White Pine and I'm, I'm a strength and conditioning trainer there I'm not the wilderness survival expert but I have like taught classes where you know and I'm you know teaching kids how to make fire and they're making the uh they're shaving or uh, like whittling wood shavings and then using that to start their own fire and um like and then so they might be like seven years old eight years old nine years old <clears throat> they're using a knife with a four or five inch blade or whatever it is and then they're making a fire with um, the flint striker. And so these are like little kids. And then I work at, so I have like a, <clears throat> I, I, I do a few different things. But... Uh-oh. Okay, we're back on. Yeah, so what I was uh, saying was at, at White Pine, I've, you know, I taught kids and they're, they're um, whittling wood and with a, a knife, with a four inch blade, five inch blade, whatever it is. And then they will make a fire by themselves with the, the flint striker. It's like steel and magnesium. Right. And these are kids, these are little kids. But I have a couple of jobs. I have what I call my job job. I work at this place on, on a machine and we have like these razor knives. But now we have to use like these safety knives. So these are all grown men, 30, 40 years old, and we have to use these safety blades. But then seven year olds at White Pine can use a knife that's like bigger than their hand and it's fine. So it's, right. I know, I understand like why they do it because like corporate stuff, they want to like eliminate there's like a hierarchy of like safety stuff. So you can, if there's a safety problem, you, if you can eliminate it, you just get rid of it. And then if you can't get rid of it, then there's training. And then if there's, you know, so there's like this, but I guess people in like other, other uh, parts of the business were uh, cutting themselves with this, with the razor knives. And so now everybody has to use a safety blade and they don't work as well. And it's like, there's this, so then, I would imagine 
So getting back to like you're teaching these Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts these different things, you find that they're like it's just kind of like in their DNA. Because that's what I found like at White Pine, this stuff is just like in their DNA to to do this. They can focus on it, and like some of the parents have said, like when we were when we had our uh, uh, our our tent at the uh, Earth Day thing at the Jewish Community Center. Uh-huh. There was, uh, I was teaching fire and all day long, I was surrounded by kids oh, like yeah. one after another making fire. And the, a lot of the parents would say, I've never seen them just like focus so intently on something and try something. They're for so sp- determined to do it. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They Cause like it, it happened. They've seen it happen. They're going to do it. They're going to make this fire. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah, it, it was interesting. And, you know, it's like something like if you show an adult, they'll get it in just a minute. But sometimes it takes kids a while to figure, that, figure it out. And, but it happens, it's like, oh! <laughs> yeah. I almost want to say, don't tell your parents because it's not in the scout book. <laughs> it's like, oh. But I had this thing about Lewis and Clark, too. I said, we're going to do a Lewis and Clark. And they said, oh, we've already had that in school. I said, yes, but were you Lewis and Clark? No, and then I had the spray bottle. And I said, the, 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 the storm is coming, the storm is coming. And, you know, and I had all these pieces of like, you know, giant pieces of logs and canvas and leather and hides and things. And they, I said, you have to quick make your, make your, make your shelter, make your shelter. And so I kind of had them do the one. So it was uh, uh, strong, like, a, you know, triangle or a V into a tree and they said okay there go from here it's now strong go from there and they 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 and they made an incredible they made incredible little shelters and then I just sprayed water and said here here's the storm and they jumped inside and they were so proud <laughs> that they had made this shelter all by themselves with the things that I had brought. So it was very cool. That's that is really cool. What about Lewis and Clark? Are they being taught incorrectly in school? I don't think they're taught, I think they're just taught facts. They're not really taught what they ate and what and the animals they saw. They just talked about that they went on this trek. And they, I don't think they're taught that they found out that uh, when they were going to go over the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, it was actually five ridges and not just one. But there were all kinds of things that I would talk about how they thought they could wear their uniforms all the way through and then they realized they had to actually learn from the Native Americans how to make moccasins and how to make a shirt out of the uh, hides. So it was kind of cool because they, they kind of became that, those people. And that was neat. Yeah, they, they kind of became like the natives. Right. That's, yeah. And that was, that, that's what I like to like make them be or not make them but see that they have to, they can use their brains to actually decide how they're going to get through these challenges because they're gonna and i don't think that the kids know as much about challenges now in life that everybody has i think they're given too much too much um good stuff in them when they're younger and they don't really understand about everybody has challenges everybody mm-hmm. so yeah I guess there's this, like, uh, there's too much stuff. That's what I see anyway from the guys around me. Yeah. What do you, I guess there's like this fine line because like a lot of, um, uh, like they have like, there's, there's a saying like your, um, your grandparents were, warriors so your parents could be farmers so you can be an artist uh and i I think there's like this um thing where we want our kids to have better than what we had and we have like this pressure or guilt and for you know maybe there's some good reason to have like the kids like keep them away from all these dangers and all these bad things and and but it seems like you you see the value of showing that, um, like the, it's the, like the the difficulties 
really are what make you stronger and what like, give you character. And right. So I went for a hike and I said, okay, you guys can take off your shoes. I'm going, well, we can't take off our shoes. It was in the woods and it was nice, but they were so used to wearing your shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were walked along and they slowly started taking their shoes off and realizing that the path was beaten down and it was in the fall. So there were lots of leaves. And then uh, another person walked by and they said, and then the mother explained to the daughter, oh, it's probably because they got their shoes wet. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they took their feet shoes off. But then they, I was talking to them about, about grounding and how important that is, that we're not, you know, we're just not connected to the earth anymore. And I still go barefoot all the time, as much as I can. Yeah, and you were saying, like before we start recording, you said you're, you're 76? Yeah, uh-huh. And you're on zero prescriptions. I don't have any medications. I just eat good food. I have an organic garden. So, and I started doing this when Michael was in, um, he was in Montessori and I looked at the other people and the food they were bringing their children. I'm going, okay, what is that? And that's Tim Penn. What? What's that? And, you know, tofu and the, the different things that were like, and I just started doing research about eating better and eating well. And I just, my whole life changed. So my kids all grew up eating really good diets too which is nice and they're, they're pretty healthy. Nice. Much, it's much, a much better way to go to be real in the world and to be not dependent on the boxed things that the convenience foods and the restaurants, uh, which is crazy. Yeah. And you're mostly vegan too, right? You said like sometimes I, you'll eat eggs in the winter, but. I'm mostly vegan. That's just because I, I learned about how, in the fifth grade, I learned about how the animals were treated in the slaughterhouse because my fifth grade teacher, that was her summer job. And that was the end of that. And my, that was, uh, that was okay. That was good. They did not bite me on it, which was nice. I grew up in the woods, making, climbing trees and making tree forts. And that's probably why I like to uh, be my Cub Scout leader. <laughs> yeah, there's something about climbing trees I, I i i climb trees still and i did a little video i, I climbed um, there's these pines right across the street from white pine um, wilderness academy and it's it's real easy to climb real high and so I, I went up there the other day and just like sit i was sitting up there for about 45 minutes or so and i could hear the like church bells from butler like it like plays kind of like a song kind of right and so I like took a video of it and, and, and you can hear the, the church bells on the, um, and then like, so I did that like pretty much like as soon as I got up there, I heard it and then I just like put the phone away and I was just, just sat up there for about 45 minutes and there, it's like, there's, there's always like some kind of like lesson. Cause I, I go on, I used to call them like these like mini like vision quests. Like if I, if I was trying to like figure something out, then I would just like go out in the woods and then I would see something. It could be like how these two branches are together or how, or something. And then there'd be like some kind of like instant download of a ton of information like, Oh, that, okay. That's why I came here to see this. And then, but it's just like this instant, like somebody gives you a book. Okay. Well, you might be like, Oh, this looks like a really cool book but then you got to like read the book and it takes a long time to like read the book. So that, that's kind of how these things work for me. So when you're like going out now, do you, like you saw like the mountain in the background, you're talking about like walking around barefoot. Do you like get like these kind of like lessons still from like going out these ways and like being barefoot and Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, that those paintings are really neat. There's a lot of people that still don't get the, about the barefoot thing. <laughs> it's very interesting to kind of go over, you go over rocks, you know, let's get, just kind of let them roll through your feet, you know, not just all of a sudden you have to kind of roll through the different kind of textures that you're going to be you know, encountering when you're taking a hike or something. And it's really kind of cool. <laughs> it makes your feet yeah. like. 
And your feet are important. And do you have like, are are the winters harsh there? Like, is, does it get really cold? They, it, it gets really cold. It's surprisingly, it's not been. It's only up in the mountains, a little bit of snow. But once it starts snowing, which is going to be probably next week, and it stays snowy all winter, but it doesn't really go below zero. So it it gets it gets cold. It gets the cold and stays until until the March. So it's very short. It's a long winter, longer than in Indiana. Yeah. And like, is there a, like a certain temperature where you won't go outside barefoot? Like, and you'll just. I, I've gone out to feed my chickens and barefoot. It's like, oh, okay, I, I, I could do this. Okay, run back. Because my chickens are about a hundred foot away. They're not like really close. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. That's Michael's going to be going to something um, up in Minnesota. That's going to be about fire and ice. All about you know, it's going to be into the water, you know, freezing water, and then hot saunas. So that'll be interesting. Aren't, aren't you going with him to that? I am. I'm going to be his transliterator. He can, leave, he can read my lips. I don't, it's like magic. So I get to go for free. I'm going to go with him. I'll probably do the things too. <gasps> yeah, it looked really cool. He, uh, he sent me something about him uh, going to it and that it looked really really interesting so um, you were saying that you um, can you like, explain like what was going on with his hearing and then you said you how you taught him how to talk yeah he's Michael um, was born profoundly deaf there's only about five percent of the people that are deaf that are really profoundly deaf and so at 18 months old, he got a hearing aid. And I could see where he was already going for hot. If I, you know, take like a piece of toast, he'd go, you could see that your mouth was making something. And slowly, slowly, I would just every talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, I think his first word was off. He would, he would, he would, he would mouth a lot of words, but he wouldn't, there was, he could not hear word, anything. So he would just mouth them, then there was no sound. But one time, and then you feel, ah, he goes, ah. And so one time he turned off the, he was 18 months old, he turned off the light, and he went off. Ah! So that was, and then he had all these words, and then he realized that all this, moving his mouth and then making sounds. And uh, slowly when he was in the third grade, I had a thing called the event book, and it was everything that happened. Like, oh, good, my car is broken, yay. And I, I draw because I'm an artist draw my old car which was a, a ambulance it was like an ambulance that i took my artwork around to different shows with mm. bright red and i said oh good my car is broken i said i'd write down my car is broken and all the words were in red and my you know his name was in blue and he started he started adding things and adding things so he started talking and realizing that when your mouth moves that is a word and that means something so that was, and he ended up going to uh, St. Louis for two years, which was like really painful, but I saw him every two weeks and he came home after the second week. His teacher said, Michael doesn't belong here anymore because he's so uh, outgoing. He's so outgoing and he's so bright that he picks up so much. So I had to find a school, which I went to Orchard Country Day School. It's a, I, w well, I went to a lot of schools and they were going, no, no, we can't have him because, you know, we just can't. So the so two teachers, I said, this is ridiculous. I need to talk to the teachers. So I found the teachers that were in this one little um, private school that was kind of open concept, kind of nice. And so I talked to the teachers and they said, yes, we want Michael to come. And so I, I entered Michael as a, just a student, but not a, but not as a deaf student. And so by the time they found out he could really, you know, he's really bright, then he, I have a picture of Michael. You see Michael? See Michael? Almost. Uh, a little bit more in front of your face. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a little, little guy then. Two hearing aids. You know, that was when he was uh, three. So he, 
So he came back to school and he came back to a regular school and he had a tutor and he went to a regular, uh, regular junior high, which was kind of wild because he was kind of caught in the, in the um, busing. So he was sent out west to a lot of kids that didn't understand him or to junior high, but then he went to um, Jesuit high school. And that was, and then he also ended up in Purdue in engineering. And now he's a biomedical engineer and a uh, oh. forger and a uh, um, uh, earth person. <laughs> so. Yeah, I didn't know he was a biomedical engineer. I had, I had no idea. I know he does a lot of um, like wild uh, food gathering. That's and what he does. That's his um, real world. His, his making money world is a biomedical engineer. So, wow. with Eli, with not Eli Lilly, but um, what's it called? Uh, Anyway, the, they make hospital equipment. You know, like Roche or something? Um, no, Hillrom. Okay. Yeah, that's well. hospital equipment. So he's always testing out new equipment for them. Well, that's, that's really cool. So do you think um, like part of your, cause like you were saying, like the, you know, part of him growing up. So he has that as a, you know, something difficult to get through and then your dis, your determination to make it just as an artist. And then, so like sometimes, um, like you said, some like, you know, the house was kind of falling apart and you have like these things going wrong. Do you think like all of that together made it so he could, cause he is like really outgoing and, and you could see, um, how somebody that might have, that might be deaf, maybe they don't want to talk, but he does talk. He is yeah. outgoing people and the, and the people that would sign did not want to talk to Michael at all did not want to have anything to do with him because he was he they said he was denying his culture so he was kind of like uh, his own little pioneer and I never I never said he was um deaf I was said he had a challenge and then when people would be mean to him I said you know that's their challenge too he said why is this person so mean to me or you know make fun of me I said that's their challenge a lot of people can't see what their challenge is. But their challenge might be that they have to have more compassion with others. You know, a lot of people have challenges and you don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was really cool. So. Yeah, that, that can be a tough one for, for people too. That's, you know, the, like maybe somebody has like some kind of, uh, or maybe it's like a racist or maybe it's a, uh, a bully of whatever sort to like see them as they're just like you they're they have like these challenges and so if somebody has something that's as appalling as like being a racist or something like that to be like well that's you know it's still one of us it's still and part of our overcome what they were taught when they were a little boy a little girl mm -hmm. you know they were taught these things it didn't happen when they were little you know this you're kind of you're kind of taught that so michael's favorite michael's best friend was uh, biracial so that was that was really cool because he also had challenges too yeah doesn't you know they not quite fit into either world kind of thing right that's interesting that you, like you said like the 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 other like uh deaf kids wouldn't ex didn't want to accept him because he was talking Did, right that, that seems so I, I wouldn't have thought of that that they would have some kind of problem parents too their parents were like also oh no 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 because we were like denying michael's deafness by teaching him how to talk and in the fourth grade michael michael had learned some signs and he was going i am not signing and he got so much um, grief from his aunts and uncles and different people in the family that said, you're denying what Michael needs to have. And I said, Michael's making this decision. He said, he's only in the fourth grade. I said, Michael knows what he wants. This is what he wants. You know, you know so when Michael was in the seventh grade, he wanted to be an entrepreneur. That was, <laughs> then how do you know that word? <laughs> so he was very, uh, uh, self-actualized 
you know, very always looking to see what the challenges were, accepting challenges and going from there. So he doesn't use sign language? No. And so I, I knew him originally from, he's been to like my workshops, uh, for like uh, strength work workshops. And, and uh, Matt Scholl, the owner of White Pine, I know that he went as his translator um, to a, a Rafe Kelly uh, workshop. Um, he's like a movement guy. I don't know if you know who he is. Mm -hmm. But I, Matt was telling me about it. I was like, oh, you speak sign language? And Matt was like, no. He's like, he just reads lips. And I was like, okay, that's cool. But I didn't, I didn't know that he did not know sign language. And when like Kristen um, would come as his interpreter to my workshops, mm -hmm. I knew that she was like, he was just like watching her speak after I, I would say something and then she was ta talking to him. And uh, I didn't realize that maybe she was not doing sign language also, or I guess it didn't click. But that was, um, why was he so adamant about not learning that also? That wasn't his friends. That were, he was around people that were talking. So I went to the deaf school. I took him to the deaf school when he was three. And he was, it's about two miles from my house. And he went through a whole book, three whole books of lip reading, lip reading, lip reading. And the only word that he didn't know was skirt. And I said, that's because I don't wear one. I'm always on the floor with Michael with my pants on. <laughs> and I didn't really have a, I didn't really wear a skirt. So he didn't even know that word. So he said, you know, he doesn't, Michael doesn't belong here. And I said, well, where does he belong? He said, well, there's a school in St. Louis that you can go to. So I, <laughs> that was kind of painful and that was really hard. And I finally ended up talking to people that had uh, sent their kids there. And they said that was the best thing that they'd ever done. They came home every two weeks on the airplane and Michael was only there for two years. And then his, his teacher said, Michael doesn't belong here. He's ready to go to a regular school. So I did find a tutor and I found a school that was like really wanted to have Michael. So that was awesome. Yeah. Yay. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> so there's, there's lip reading books. There's books that teach you how to lip read. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Uh, books on everything, but I didn't, I never. I don't know about lip reading. There's a, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, when he was 18 months old, had a thing about, you know, okay, we're going to talk about shoes. This is a shoe, and that's a shoe. Well, over here, that's a shoe. Okay, that's a dog. Well, that's a dog, too. This is another dog. And all these different kinds of things are dogs. The dog, this is a dog, 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 dog. This is a drink, this is a drink, this is a drink, this is a drink. And so, well, it was like, whoa. There was, it was just slowly but surely, and he was gathering all these words. And so when he said the word off, then everything just kind of went crazy. And then I also taught him how to have fun with their language. And so if something happened, I said, oh, the gorilla. And I'd act like a gorilla and show him a gorilla. The gorilla did it. So then he, when, when something happened, and Michael like, did something naughty, he said, oh, the gorilla, gorilla, the gorilla <laughs> did it. <laughs> <laughs> when he went to school in St. Louis, I said, Michael has a sense of humor. And so please don't squash that sense of humor because he likes to have fun with the words too. So that was, that was cool. So it was a good choice. It was a, a group of nuns. So Sister Julie was the one that said, Michael doesn't belong here anymore. After a second year there, he came home in the, week, um, in the summer. So. Wow, that's. And I did those event books, you know, to everything that's happened, I, I write about it or just talk about the days of the week and I still didn't know the days of the week yet. Oh my gosh, there's things you don't even, you just take for granted that the kids pick up. Mm. I, don't, I don't think he knows about that yet. You know, Whoa, huh. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Since, since I've been doing the podcast, and uh, which I started in February, I've been really digging into like how communication works. And I was thinking like it with like relationships. So if you have like a husband, a wife, a friend, and, you, and you're, you're talking to this person and it seems like they're not getting it. You're, they know all the words that you're saying, but it seems like for some reason they don't understand what you mean. Like, like the, their response doesn't make sense to you. 
like like uh, or it's from their world it's from their history that's why yeah so when words mean something else to them this saying their world means something else to you in their body language also in, in you know engaging so when like when you found that like uh so i guess it, i mean just because it happens with everybody else i would imagine that this happens with michael too like you're you're are do you find that you're you're trying to tell him something and maybe he knows all the words that you're saying but or that maybe he's like missing something here and there and then do you is there do you think there's more miscommunication or do you think he just pretty much gets it or that there's even maybe even more understanding because he's looking at you just as much as he's I mean maybe not listening like I guess just I don't know what how to ask the question exactly but like is there a lot of miscommunication or do you think he um not really I think we're both pretty much real when we talk and so we don't use as many words as much and we make sure the other person understands what we're saying so hmm. and he's you know he's looking at your whole face when you're talking you can't just um look at your mouth and he really has trouble when people have mustaches because then they've a lot of times they've covered up their mouth so hmm. and i don't read it all i mean if, if i knew you were going to say i love you and you said i love I would know what you said, but otherwise, eh. Hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a gift. He just has a gift. So. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing, really, how it all, how that yeah. works out, because he, he is so interesting. He's so, like, outgoing, as you were saying. He's always doing something. Every time I, um, like, flipping through Facebook or something like that. He's always going to some new seminar or workshop. He's always doing like some outdoorsy thing with a bunch of people around. And he seems to be, I just surround himself with um, people that like r really understand and that are like trying to. Uh, He's very outgoing. He always has been. So that's kind of awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, well, I'm um, about out of questions for you. I could kind of like dig into this stuff for a long time. Is there anything else that you're wanting to talk about before we? I have to say really fast. I was um, a physical, being very physical is very important to me. And I was on a women's rowing team for um, 20 years, actually competitive rowing team for 20 years. I still have a, a shell, which I row on the lake, a little shell. And we... We, it was um, Eli Lilly had bought a bunch of boats in, in Indianapolis, and so we had, we had, and then the Purdue people came down and taught us how to talk, how to row, and then we had a coach come down that was from Philadelphia. So we went to all kinds of rowing things. And my daughter's now. I got Michael into the boat. He was like, "This is not fun," because <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't hear, and know when to stop and when to go, and uh. But um. My daughter's not doing it right now. She's fell in love with it. She's in Northern Michigan. She's trying to get me to move up there, but I love it here. And uh, I think that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. My I have a niece that she was into competitive rowing and um, like at Eagle Creek Park. She was yeah. from Ohio, but they traveled all over. We start. We started. We actually started the club, and. Um, we were working on it. We just, we went to meetings and they said, "Okay, you're at the meeting, so you have to have to. You're going to be doing more than rowing. You're going to actually be putting the, the club together." So that was awesome. I know they're still rowing. That's yay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's awesome to be out in the in the woods and row instead of being you know in a city. It's much different. You can go early in the morning and see all kinds of animals and things and mm -hmm. beavers scurrying around and egrets and eagles and things. Yeah, cool. yeah, that's really, really cool. Uh, so how can, uh, if people want to check out more of your art and, uh, or buy it, how do they get a hold of you? How do they find it? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just starting an Instagram thing right now, and I have to get more savvy with that. 
So I have Instagram and it's under Sunda, S-U-N-D-A. Otherwise I have my Facebook, which is Susan Sunda Martian, but I'm changing my last name. Okay. Yeah. I'll put a link to your, uh, I put a link to your Facebook in, uh, when I share it and then okay. people can like figure it out. And, um, so it's, it's all, uh, like you do everything on leather. So you're doing, um, I have to work with my hands. I started doing painting, but it was like, ah, then I discovered leather and I just started tooling and I did a whole series of Shakespeare many years ago. That was really cool. But I, I have to work with my hands, so that's why I do that leather. <laughs> yeah. So it's you're uh, you're using tools to like shape Lots the leather, of, like to. I'm tooling it, like you would tool a saddle, but you no, know, it's totally different. And then I and then I mold it, and then I glue it onto a board because it's got um, three dimension to it. And I then that's my canvas, my paint with the oils. Yeah. Yeah, it all looks really, really amazing. So, um, yeah, well, thanks for uh, coming on. It was really cool. I'll, I'll get this published right away, and it'll be everywhere. And um, um, is there a anything else? Did you have any closing thoughts for us? Um, just, just be kind. <laughs> be kind to animals, too. Be kind to, to nature that's, you know, if you think about the Indian culture and just try to recreate what they, what they've, that we've kind of lost, you know, go gentle into the world, spread love, <laughs> all the good hippie things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that makes good sense to me. So, yeah. um, all right, well, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and I'll talk to you for just a second after I hit stop. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Bye.